Hello, everyone. It's Friday. We are heading up toward this weekend. I have a very important announcement, very important announcement. Daylight savings time begins this weekend. This Lord's Day at 2 o'clock in the morning, daylight saving time begins. It changes our time here in America twice a year. I only emphasize one of them, however. The other one doesn't matter so much. This one does. The other one doesn't matter because even if you don't pay attention, it doesn't mess with your worship schedule. It'll only make you early. If you miss this one, you'll miss the worship altogether. <laughs> so I'm emphasizing this one. Fall back, spring forward. When you go to sleep on Saturday night, whatever time that is, if it's 10 o'clock, then you push it to 11 o'clock. That's where you, you change your time to 11 o'clock. If you go to sleep at 9 o'clock, then 10 o'clock. If you go to sleep at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, of course. Most of you won't have to worry because your computers and your fancy, uh, fancy clocks do it for you. But some of you will still have to be concerned. And uh, if your alarm clock is one of those analog ones and you need to, go ahead and change that time. Spring forward. Okay? All right. Today, the meditation that I want to bring to you is a very, very important passage, a very important one that is quoted in the New Testament, but also used very much all around, very important. It's important because it's a transition time. Transition times are very important in our lives. Almost every single one of them marks a time when we can draw closer to God or fall further away from God. Whether you're transitioning from junior high school to high school or different grades or what have you, or going away to college or getting married, all those transition times mark times when you can draw closer to God or fall further away from him. Right now, we are looking at a time in the history of Israel when Moses, the leader of the people of Israel, the very person through whom God brought his people, liberated them from slavery in Egypt, he's going to die. In the book of Deuteronomy, at the very end, you have the account of the death of Moses. So in a sense, much of this is all in preparation for that. And so that God might reassure the hearts of the Israelite people, God gives them a promise. You see how important it is? God gives them a promise that they can bank on. This Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Let's read it. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. God says, I am going to set up for you somebody who will take the place of Moses from among your brothers. So someone like Moses, God will raise to carry on the work and fulfill his promises. Immediately following, the, uh, following Moses, we're going to have the time of the judges, Joshua, and then it leads into the time of the judges. So God raises up these judges, these leaders for his people that are like Moses, but unlike him too. And then after that, and in the very context, God says he is going to set up kings for the people of Israel. Eventually they will have kings. These kings are also people who are like Moses and aspects of the fulfillment of God's promise that God would raise up people from among them to lead them. Has God done that? Yes. God was absolutely faithful in setting up judges and setting up these kings. But the judges were unfaithful. You start with a judge named Othniel. This is in the book of Judges. This is what's called the downward spiral of the judges. You start with Othniel. He has the perfect genealogy. His record seems quite clean. But then by the time you get toward the end of the book of Judges, you're hitting the bottom of the barrel and digging the ground with Samson. Samson is a world of a mess. But by the end of the story, God is still faithful. God has not left his people. And then eventually God sets up kings. But the kings are not faithful either. 
Even a person like David, who is in the end called a man after God's own heart, he was an adulterer and murderer. So very, very imperfect, very, very flawed judges, flawed kings, pointing to the fact that they are not the full fulfillment of the promise that God gave to Moses. Moses himself could not live up to the calling to lead God's people rightly or perfectly. There had to be somebody like him, but better than him. And so this verse is quoted in the New Testament. The story here that is surrounding this passage is Peter has by God's grace, perform the miracle. All the crowds have gathered, and he's taking this opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's proclaiming Jesus to them. And what passage is he using to proclaim Jesus? You guessed it. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. This is what Peter says. Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. We just read that. Clear. We're on the same ground, aren't we? This is exactly what we just read. The promise that God gave. And then Peter moves right into how God fulfilled that promise. God having raised up his servant. That's a reference to King Jesus. Sent him to bless you first. To to you first and bless you. God raised up King Jesus and sent him to you first to be a blessing to you. Jesus is the one who is like Moses, but far better than Moses. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, if Moses is a building, Jesus is the builder. The builder is better than the building. (laughs) And that's who your Jesus is. Well, in what way? Why did Moses not make it into the promised land? Why is it that he could not lead his people into the promised land, even though that's what he was looking forward to all of his ministry, all his life? He wanted to lead the people of God. Because Moses failed. He failed to trust in God, trust in God's leadership. He felt that he had to assert himself. He had to find security for himself. And because he failed to trust and believe in God, He failed to lead the people of God into the promised land. And it doesn't matter that much if you don't fully understand his failure. That's a different sermon for a different day. But understand that Moses was also a very flawed man. How is Jesus better than Moses? Jesus is perfect. He struggles. He fights. He is sorrowful. And he is joyful. In the middle of all of that, however, he never sins, never fails. He never relies on his own resources. He never insists on his own will. He insists on the will of the Father. He's following the direction of the Holy Spirit, even if he should cause him his very own life. He lives a perfect life and offers it up as the perfect sacrifice. And that's another way that Jesus is far better than Moses. Moses at one point, when the people of Israel were sinning so badly, Moses said, God, if you will not take these people because they're so sinful, why don't you kill me instead? Why don't you kill me instead and take these people? I believe that is the meaning of what Moses was proposing. And God said, no. God said, no. I will not take you to die on behalf of my people. When Jesus says, why don't you take my life instead of the lives of these people, God said, yes. Jesus is better than Moses because Jesus was the sacrifice Moses could never be. And God accepted that perfect payment for our sin, for our failure through Jesus. So Jesus is... Jesus perfectly fulfills the promise made here in Deuteronomy 18 and then much, 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 much more. God is faithful to his promise. He gave us King Jesus, which has a word of comfort for those of us who failed miserably, 
We can try so hard to protect and provide for our families and the people in our care. We can try so hard to have the perfect ministry, but fail in so many ways. Failures that are, that are obvious and that are also hidden. But in the middle of all of that, we can know that there is grace for this because Jesus has purchased that grace for us and that we have room to grow. You see, because look, this is what Jesus has done. Jesus, through his perfect life and death, has given us a commission. He has given us a promise to fulfill, which is to be Jesus to all those with whom we come in contact and for whom we are responsible. Jesus gave us that really high calling. Where do you find that, Pastor Paul? Jesus said to his disciples, As I have loved you, you ought to love one another. The Apostle John says that by our love, we make the invisible God visible. Isn't that exactly what Moses was doing? He was representing God to the people. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Jesus is the word of God, the revelation of God that makes the invisible God visible. Jesus is no longer visible now, but by loving one another, what do we do? We make the invisible love of God visible to one another. We become Moses, better, even much higher. We become Jesus to one another. How can we fulfill this kind of a calling? By the grace of God. When we fail, when we fall, how can we get up again? By the grace of God. And because there is the cross, though we will never be the kind of Moses or the kind of Jesus that he deserves us to be, we will continue to grow on this side of eternity and there is grace for our failure. Application number one. Though God calls us to fulfill the promise of Deuteronomy 18 in our lives, in our own way, there is grace for our failure. The same reason why there was grace for Moses' failure, same reason why there's, there's grace for a, a murderer and an adulterer like David, that he would in the end be called a man after God's own heart, there is grace for failing, falling Moses' representatives of Jesus. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, and friends. First application. Second application. Let's appreciate, and this is really the point of the text of this message today. Let's appreciate the faithfulness of God through people like Moses, Joshua, Judges, the kings. Most importantly, the faithfulness of God fulfilled in King Jesus. And then in him, the faithfulness of God seen in those who have preached to you the gospel, in those who have lived the gospel before you. For many of you, those are your grandparents, your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, even your children. Appreciate the Moseses, no, the Jesuses in your life. And give thanks to God for his faithfulness flowing through them. How God has continued to point you to Jesus through them. With this next song, let's do that. Let's have grace for all the shepherds in our lives. All the brokenness. And let's use them. And let us also point them and everybody else to King Jesus, who is our strength. Let's worship. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. We sing his name, Jesus.
Amen. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is. Amen. Let's sing his name. Sing Jesus! sing worthy 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 is your name king jesus to be lifted up to lift it be lifted high with this confession we also repent of the ways that we have not proclaimed you rightly when we've lost our temper when we give it, given in to our besetting sins our vices that turn our gaze away from you you deserve a much better representation of your perfection. We thank you for the grace to rise again. And committing you to do so, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings to you. Can't wait to worship with you this Lord's Day.